So now we've come to St Mary's Square. You've got St Mary's Church you're about 100 yards away and this is the St Mary's Square. Now that, we think it's that building, we're pretty sure it's that building, is the first ever Methodist church in uh, Bury St Edmunds. Not that special I hear you say. I agree, that's rubbish. But next door, that one there, we think, it has to be that one, doesn't it? Can't be any others. They're all modern. Yeah. That ain't got a next door. It don't look like a church. They look modern. It has to be that house there. In that house lived a guy called Thomas Clarkson. Now, Thomas Clarkson uh, was a big part of ending slavery. He were right into ending slavery. And it was 1807 when it actually got abolished in England. And he was a big part of that happening. But he wasn't happy to stop there. He carried on trying to abolish slavery worldwide, especially in America. So you think about, if you're American and you're watching this, thinking about uh, slavery, it was obviously a massive thing with all the Negroes and stuff. Everyone knows all about it. He was a big part of it, and he lived there. But that isn't the most interesting person who's ever lived there. Well, it probably is, but I'm more interested in someone else. His name was John Le Messurier. You're probably thinking he's French. He wasn't. He was English. Um, you've still never heard of him, have you? He was in Dad's army. He was Sergeant Wilson in Dad's army. <laughs> See, I, I did tell you, sir, didn't I, that uh, she's got my ration book. Again, that won't mean anything to you Americans, but to us English people, everyone has heard of the hit comedy, Dad's army. It's like a World War II thing, a comedy and it's hilarious, and he lived there in that very, very house. You didn't know that, did you? No. No. Just going back to the whole abolishing slavery thing, he was a big part of that. There's another little story I'm coming on to later in Bury St Edmunds of someone who loved slavery, because that's how they became rich. They had 300 Negroes, as it says on the notes. I don't know if that's a politically correct thing to say nowadays, but they had 300 Negroes working for them and they got rich in a sugar plantation. And that's further up and we'll show you that in a bit. But they were around in the same time. Sorry about the noise of the lorry. We're right next to a road. They were around at the same time. This woman died, I think, in 1809. And he, he managed to help abolish slavery in 1807. So when she was a little old lady and dying, this posh woman from a posh family, because her family had loads of Negroes, uh, he lived here and I'm sure they must have known each other. So we're right outside the Green King Brewery at the moment. It absolutely stinks, <laughs> yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine coming to work with an hangover and smelling that? You'd gip straight away. Um, but they need some help at the moment. They've got a vacancy for a beer elf. If anyone's interested in being a beer elf, go for it. I'm too tall. No, I'm short enough. You're short enough, but yeah. you're not really... A massive beer drinker, are you? No. <laughs> but yeah, if you'd like to have a chat, get yourself inside. They need a beer elf. What the hell is a beer elf? <laughs> okay, so Mazzy is not going to be happy with this one because we've walked a long way, 300 yards, and the story really isn't that interesting. But I just wanted to point this out. We're opposite the Methodist church at the moment, which uh, opposite here you've got a row of eight houses, eight terrace houses. And if you look at each chimney up here, you can't see it on them all, but it is on a certain part of each one, is the initials RH. Now, what does RH stand for? That stands for the guy who had these built. His name was Robert Harvey. I don't know what year it was, but he was a baker, and his, his bakery shop was just round this corner, and his house was just up there. You see, like, the whitish, creamish coloured building? Um, that was his house, so he ordered these to be made, he had his initials put on each chimney and you can imagine he lived there and he'd come to, uh, to his bakery every single morning at probably four o'clock in the morning and on his way he'd probably just pop over here and see how the building were getting on. But yeah, very uninteresting story. I'm really sorry to drag you 300 metres just for that. But I just like the fact, you know, you've got RHs on the chimneys because of Robert Harvey and he, it, it were his idea and he lived here. It, it is interesting for somebody 
Well, if you're a baker and you've got a baker's shop just around the corner, it's interesting to... All right, it's not interesting. Let's just move on. That was boring. Yeah. Move on. So just next to the row of houses, just show them that again. I didn't realise how close it was. It's literally next door. The Rose and Crown pub. Now, there's a bit of a story here. Back in the olden days, you used to be able to go to the pub with a jug or a bottle and say, will you fill that up for us, please, so we can drink it at home? You can't do that nowadays, apart from in there. Um, what you'd do is you'd take a big milk jug or something, your dad would send you out with a milk jug, you'd go in there, and they'd fill it up with pints and charge you by the half pint. You know, sim simple. But what you'd do is ask for a, a light Eno, or a dark Eno, that's what they called them around here. So a light Eno was just beer mixed with a bottle of light ale, a dark Eno, uh, a beer, draft beer, mixed with a bottle of dark ale. And the name Eno comes around, the think, because some local once, someone went up to a local in a pub and says, oh, what, what do you want to drink? And he just went, oh, Eno meaning he knows, the barman knows because I'm a local, I drink the same thing every day, he know. So that's where the name light, light he know and dark he know come from, apparently. But this is a thing from the 1800s, you can't get it anymore, apart from in that pub, apparently they still do it. I don't know if that's true or not, and I think it's the same people running the pub, or the same family, they've run it for 40 odd years which is very unheard of uh, back in, uh, around England nowadays. Well, that a bit more interesting? A little bit, yeah. Won't much though, were it? Yeah. <laughs> I will get you a good story, trust me, just bear with me. So now we're at number 63 Whitting Street. You Whiting keep saying it's Whiting. Street. It could be Whiting. <laughs> to me, it looks like Whitting. Um, to see an angel. Now, the house itself, when did you say? 14? 1400s. 1400s, the house is from. In fact, if you take a look at it from the front, you will see it looks very, very old. There's quite a few houses in Bury which look like this. It reminds me of Lavisham. Uh, Lavisham, is it? Lavenham. Lavenham. It's very much like Lavenham. It's a beautiful house. But we've come to see an angel. Now, the, the man's just come out because he saw us looking around the house, the man who owns it, and he's told us a little bit of the history, which it's upset me a bit. Yeah, Because really. I thought this was going to be a very old angel, <laughs> and apparently it's not. It's only from about the 1960s. Um, the guy who carved it is still alive, apparently. But here is the angel, and the thing which is different about it is his wings are upside down. In fact, if the guy's still alive who did it, I wonder if he feels quite embarrassed about the fact everyone now knows that he put the angel wings on upside down. Maybe it was purposely done like that for a reason. Maybe it was purposefully done, I don't know. Yeah. It's a very beautiful carving and a very beautiful window. But I thought that was going to be as old as the house and it isn't. But uh, yeah, just something, you know, if you're in Bury St Edmunds it's worth a quick look at. So behind me now is the dog and partridge, or as you call it, the D&P. It's just so lazy. Locals, local, locals call it D and P. D and P. It's it's the dog and partridge. Anyway, stopped here for two reasons. Firstly, the most important one for me because people who know me very well know that I've got a really morbid, sick, weird fascination with mermaids. There's a lot of things I'd love to do to mermaids. Um, that used to be called the Mermaid Inn. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I know. It was called that. the Mermaid Inn. I don't know why, but it was. And the second thing is the Theatre Royal, which, just give me that. Is that where you're going tonight? Yeah. You're going yeah. tonight to the Theatre Royal to watch some kids. Treasure Island. Treasure Island or something. <laughs> just adjust that. Um, where is it? Is it near here? I think it's just over there, yeah. Just around the corner. Yeah. And in years gone by, many, many, many years ago, uh, they used to... the landlords here used to open late at night after a performance because people from the theatre this place was well known people from the theatre wanted to come here to try the very well known rook pie what is that? well a rook it's like a crow oh okay <laughs> the bird a crow which i've never heard of anyone eating a crow before but a rook pie and the pub itself used to get its rooks by shooting them on the church green just over here so you can imagine them oh there's a performance tonight let's go out with gun go around to church graveyard 
and shoot some rooks and that's what they did. We're just walking down the road here and Maz is saying what's this here? And I know what that is and some of you will. It's for mounting a horse. So this is a garage in use but it must have been a stables at one point and that's what you'd do so that you could get your leg over the horse. Mazzy thought I was winding her up but it's a true story. I think you're always winding me up. I'm never winding you up. <laughs> Churchyard Avenue. This is the Great Churchyard, this is the avenue. It's got lime trees on each side and there's another avenue goes down the other side. You've got Samson's Tower behind me which is part of the Abbey and on this side you've got the charnel which I'll go into in more detail in a minute. So let's go back to 1722. There was a local barrister. His name was Arundel Coke. Very important man within uh, Bury St Edmunds. And he was in financial ruin. He'd invested all his money in something overseas. It all went nipples up. He'd run out of money. But his wife had quite a rich brother-in-law. Uh, sorry, his wife was married to quite a rich man. His wife was married to quite a rich man. Okay, his name was Crisp. Edward Crisp. So Arundel Coke thought, if I can knock her husband off, we'll inherit his, you know, his wealth and we'll be all right. So he came up with a plan. It was New Year's Day, 1722, and he invited all the family around for a big meal at his house. And that's Arundel's house where he lived, which is right next to St Mary's Church. So they had the meal, and Arundel said to Edward, Edward Crisp, he says, let's go for a walk, it's a nice night. So they went for a walk, and he brought him into this churchyard, and they were walking down this very avenue. So what Edward Crisp didn't know is Arundel had hired some local thug to jump out on him and kill him whilst they were walking down here. So this local thug jumped out with a knife, stabbed him and left him for dead. Uh, Arundel went back to his house and he says, Oh, uh, Mr Crisp, Eddie, Edward, he'll be back soon. He's just carried on walking for a little bit longer. Now Arundel didn't expect him to live. He thought he was dead. But a few minutes later, believe it or not, in through the door, crawls, covered in blood. Edward Crisp is still alive. They didn't kill him. So he crawled in and all the family came to help him. So they looked after Edward and brought him back and he told the police, the police obviously came. He told the police, he says, yeah, uh, Arundel, my brother-in-law of all people, just tried to kill me. He got some guy to jump me with a knife and I got stabbed all over. I'm lucky to be alive. So the police arrested the barrister, uh, Arundel, and this local thug and it went to trial. So the charge was that he had caused uh, Edward Crisp's nose to be split. And he challenged this, he says, whoa, 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 no, that ain't what happened. I tried to kill him. I didn't try to slit his nose, so you can't try me for slitting his nose when that ain't what I was doing. I was trying to kill him. And he says, and his nose wasn't even slit anyway. It were a bit battered and bruised and a lot of blood coming out of it, but it wasn't a proper slit. So you can't do me for a slit, because he were a barrister, you see. He were just trying to get around the law. And the judge turned around, after thinking about it, he went, shut up, you're guilty. So he got hung, he got hung, and his accomplice got hung uh, for attempted murder, right where I'm standing now. That's pretty gruesome. We're in the same graveyard, we're in the same spot. We've just turned around to give you a different view. But it's exactly the same spot. No graveyard is complete without the story of a ghost. And here we have the story of the Great Lady Ghost. Now, Henry VI, we're going back to 1447. He was coming to Bury with Parliament to try his uncle. He had an uncle called Duke Humphrey and he was on trial here in Bury for treason. So Duke Humphrey was being held here in Bury whilst all Parliament's on its way up and something happened to him. 
it got poisoned during the night. Now, some say it was poisoned, some say it was strangled, um, but the official verdict on the death certificate sort of thing, which they didn't have them in them days, so I don't know what I'm talking about, is it was a stroke, but it was poisoning. He died from poisoning. Why? Well, I can tell you why. Because the Duke was going to say at this trial, at his own trial, that the King, King Henry VI, his wife Margaret, he was going to tell everybody that Margaret were having an affair. Yeah, she was knocking about with someone called Sir Roger, Roger the Dodger. Now this is where the story gets interesting because Margaret was here, she knew that he were on trial and she was terrified that uh, her husband, the King, was going to find out about her affair. So she went to a nun, there were a nun here in Bury called uh, Maud Carew. She went up to Maud Carew, she says, I'm really worried, I've got to tell you what I've been doing. I've been knocking about with this guy, this Roger the Dodger, and I shouldn't have been doing, and I'm worried that my husband, the King's going to find out and he's going to cut my head off. Now, this is where it gets weird. The nun, Maud, she turns round to the Queen and says, well, I hate to break it to you, but I love Roger the Dodger as well, and I've been sleeping with him. Everyone's been sleeping with Roger the Dodger. It's a true story. Just to complicate things a little bit more, Roger the Dodger, he'd run away from Margaret the Queen and the nun to the Abbey here to become a monk because he didn't want to be with them anymore. So he thought he'd come here, pretend he, he, he didn't exist, and he changed his name to Brother Bernard. So he was just next door. Maud had come up here, um, and she became a nun to try and forget Roger the Dodger. So she was a nun here, he was a monk there, and they'd both done that to try and run away from each other. And now the Queen's involved. It's all getting real. It's like an episode off EastEnders, isn't it? So Queen Margaret said to Maud the nun, she says, look, we've got to do something about this because if they find out about us and Roger the Dodger, it's not going to go well for us. So she says to the nun Maud, she says, Maud, I think what you should do, there's a, an underground passage here, a tunnel, which leads right to uh, the Duke's bedroom. Go in there and poison him in the night, which she did. But what she did is she spilt some of the poison on herself when she was doing it and she became very ill. So he died, she was very ill, and she went to the local abbey to confess what she'd done because she felt really bad she knocked on the door you'll never guess who answered roger the dodger <laughs> roger the dodger answered the door and she, she thought i have to just come out clean here and tell him what i've done so she tells roger the dodger about poisoning uh, the duke and he says well it serves you right you shouldn't have done it admittedly i were part of it and i shouldn't have been sleeping with you and the queen it's all gone belly up for all of us um, but it serves you right, you're dying now, you've got poison on you, you shouldn't have tried to kill the Duke. Well, kill the Duke, she killed him. He says, uh, you'll be damned forever. And because he damned her forever, she's apparently haunts this place, haunts this graveyard, and she has done ever since. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo.